Chapter 9 They sorted the crash rations into small packs. A blanket of the water-resistant, feather-heavy Ozakian spider silk was cut into a protective covering for Vi. That piece of tailoring occupied them until the graying sky permitted them a full picture of the pocket in which the flitter had landed. The dark foliage of the mountain growth was broken here by a ledge of dark blue stone on which the flyer rested. To the right was a sheer drop, and a landslip had cut away the ledge itself a few feet behind the flitter. There was only a steadily narrowing path ahead, slanting upward. Can we take off again? Vi hoped to be reassured that such a feat was possible. Look up. Vi backed against the cliff wall, stared up at the sky. Well above them, those globes still swam in unwearied circles, commanding the air lanes. Hume had cautiously approached the outer rim of the ledge, was using his distance glasses to scan what might lie below. No sign yet. Vi knew what he meant. The globes are overhead. But the blue beast, or any other fauna those balls might summon, had not yet appeared. Shouldering their packs, they started along the ledge. Hume had his ray tube, but Vi was weaponless, unless somewhere along their route he could pick up some defensive and offensive arm. Stones had burst the lights of the islet. They might prove as effective against the blue beasts. He kept watch for any of the proper size and weight. The ledge narrowed. One shoulder scraped the cliff now as they rounded a pinnacle to lose sight of the flitter. But the globes continued to hover over them. We are still traveling in the direction they want, Vi speculated. Hume had gone to hands and knees to negotiate an ascent so steep he had to search for head and toe holds. When they were safely past that point, they took a breather, and Vi glanced aloft again. Now the sky was empty. We may have arrived, or are about to do so, said Hume. Where? Hume shrugged. Your guess is as good as mine, and both of us can be wrong. The steep ascent did not quite reach the top of the cliff around the face of which the ledge curled. Instead, their path now leveled off and began to widen out so that they could walk with more confidence. Then it threaded into a crevice between two towering rock walls and sloped downward. A path unnaturally smooth, Vi thought, as if shaped to funnel wayfarers on. And they came out on the rim of a valley. A valley centered with a wood-encircled lake. They stepped from the rock of the passage onto a springy turf which gave elastically to their tread. Vi's sandal struck a round stone. It started from its bed in the black-green vegetation, turned over so that round pits stared eyelessly up at him. He was faced by the fleshless grin of a human skull. Hume went down on one knee, examined the ground growth, gingerly lifting the lace of vertebrae forming a spine. That ended in a crushed break, which he studied briefly before he laid the bones gently back into the concealing cover of the mossy stuff. That was done by teeth. The cup of Green Valley had not changed. It was the same as it had been when they had emerged from the crevice. But now every clump of trees, every wind-rippled mound of brush promised cover. Vi moistened his lips diverted his eyes from the skull. Weathered, Hume said slowly. Must have been here for seasons, maybe planet years. A survivor from the LB? Yet this spot lay days of travel from that clearing back in the plains. How did he get here? Probably the same way we would have had we not holed up on that river island. Driven. Perhaps the lone human on Jumala herded up into this dead-end valley by the globes or the blue beasts. This process must have been in action for some time. Why? I can give you two reasons. Hume studied the nearest trees narrowly. First, for some purpose, whatever we are up against wants all interlopers moved out of the lowlands into this section, either to imprison them or to keep them under surveillance. Second, he hesitated. Vi's own imagination supplied a second reason, a revolting one he tried to deny to himself, even as he put it into words. That broken spine, food. Vi wanted Hume to contradict him, but the hunter only glanced around, his expression already sufficient answer. Let's get out of here. Vi was fighting down panic with every ounce of control he could summon, 
trying not to bolt for the crevice, but he knew he could not force himself any farther into that sinister valley. If we can, Hume's words lingered direly in his ears. Stones had smashed the globes by the river. If they still waited out there, Vi was willing to try and break them with his bare hands, should escape demand such action. Hume must have agreed with those thoughts. He was already taking long strides back to the cliff entrance. But that door was closed. Hume's foot, raised for the last step toward the crevice corridor, struck an invisible obstruction. He reeled back, clutching at Vi's shoulder. Something's there. The younger man put out his hand questingly. What his fingers flattened against was not a tight, solid surface, but rather an unseen elastic curtain, which gave a little under his prodding and then grew taut again. Together they explored by touch what they could not see. The crevice through which they had entered was now closed with a curtain they could not pierce or break. Hume tried his ray tube. They watched thin flame run up and down that invisible barrier, but not destroy it. Hume relooped the tube. Their trap is sprung. There may be another way out, but Vi was already despondently sure there was not. Those who had rigged this trap would leave no bolt holes. But because they were human and refused to accept the inevitable without a fight, the captive set off, not down into the curve of the cup, but along its slope. Tongues of brush and tree clumps brought about detours which forced them slowly downward. They were well away from the crevice when Hume halted, flung up a hand in silent warning. Vi listened, trying to pick up the sound which had alarmed his companion. It was as Vi strained to catch a betraying noise that he was first conscious of what he did not hear. In the plains there had been squeaking, humming, chitterings, the vocalizing of myriad grass dwellers. Here, except for the sighing of the wind and a few insect sounds, nothing. All inhabitants bigger than a Jumalan fly might have long ago been routed out of the land. To the left, Hume faced about. There was a heavy thicket there, too stoutly grown for anything to be within its shadow. Whatever moved must be behind it. Vi looked about him frantically for anything he could use as a weapon. Then he grabbed at the long bush knife in Hume's belt sheath. Eighteen inches of trifold steel gleamed wickedly its hilt fitting neatly into his fist as he held it point up, ready. Hume advanced on the bush in small steps, and Vi circled to his left a few paces behind. The hunter was an expert with ray tube. That, too, was part of the necessary skill of a safari leader. But Vi could offer other help. He shrugged out of the blanket pack he had been carrying on his back, tossed that burden ahead. Out of cover charged a streak of red to land on the bait. Hume blasted, was answered by a water cat's high-pitched scream. The feline writhed out of its life in a stench of scorched fur and flesh. As Vi retrieved his clawed pack, Hume stood over the dead animal. Odd, he reached down to grasp a still-twitching foreleg, stretched the body out with a sudden jerk. It was a giant of its species, a male larger than any he had seen. But a second look showed him those ribs starting through mangy fur in visible hoops. The skin tight over the skull, far too tight. The water cat had been close to death by starvation. Its attack on the men probably had been sparked by sheer desperation. A starving carnivore in a land lacking the normal sounds of small birds and animal life, in a valley used as a trap. No way out and no food. Vi fitted one thought to another out loud. Yes, pin the enemy up, let them finish off one another. But why? Vi demanded. Least trouble that way. There are plenty of water cats down on the plains. All of them couldn't be herded up here to finish each other off. It would take years, centuries. This one's capture may have been only incidental, or done for the purpose of keeping some type of machinery in working order, Hume replied. I don't believe this was arranged just to dispose of water cats. Suppose this was started a long time ago, and those who did it are gone. So now it goes on working without any real intelligence behind it. That could be the answer, couldn't it? Some process triggers into action when a ship sets down on this portion of Jamala. Maybe when one planet's under certain conditions only? Yes, that makes sense. Only why wasn't the first patrol explorer flaming in here caught? And the survey team? We were here for months, cataloging, mapping, not a whisper of any such trouble. That dead man, he's been here a long time. 
And when did the Largo Drift disappear? Five, six years ago. But I can't give you any answers. I have none. It began as a low hum, hardly to be distinguished from the distant howling of the wind. Then it slid upscale until the thin wail became an ululating scream, torturing the ears, dragging out of hiding those fears of a man confronting the unknown in the dark. Hume tugged at Vi, drew the other by force back into the brush, scratched, laced raw by the whip of branches. They stood in a small hollow with a drift of leaves high about their ankles, and the hunter pulled into place the portions of growth they had dislodged in their passage into the thicket's heart. Through gaps they could see the opening where lay the body of the water cat. The wail was cut off short, that cessation in itself a warning. Vi's body, touching earth with a knee and hand as he crouched, picked up a vibration. Whatever came towards them walked heavily. Did the smell of death draw it now, or had it trailed them from the closed gate? Hume's breath hissed lightly between his teeth. He was sighting the ray tube through a leaf gap. A snuffling, heavier than a man's panting. A vast blot, which was neither clearly paw nor hand, swept aside leaves and branches on the other side of the small clearing, tearing them casually from the shrubs. What shuffled into the open might be a cousin of the blue beasts, but where they had given only an impression of brutal menace, this was savagery incarnate. Taller than Hume, but hunched forward in its necklace outline, the thing was a monster. And over the round of the lower jaw, tusks protruded in ugly promise. Being carnivorous and hungry, it scooped up the body of the water cat and fed without any prolonged ceremony. Vi, remembering the crushed spine of the human skeleton, was sickened. Done, it reared on hind feet once again. The pear-shaped head swung in their direction. Vi was half certain he had seen that tube nose expand to test the air and scent them. Hume pressed the button of the ray tube. That soundless spear of death struck in midsection of that barrel body. The thing howled, threw itself in a mad forward rush at their bush. Hume snapped a second blast at the head, and the fuzz covering it blackened. Missing them by a precious foot, the creature crashed straight on through the ticket, coming to its knees, writhing in a rising chorus of howls. The men broke out of cover raced into the open where they took refuge behind a chimney of rock half detached from the parent cliff. Down the slope, the bushes were still wildly agitated. What was that? Vi got out between sobbing breaths. Maybe a guardian or a patrol stationed to dispose of any catch. Probably not alone, either. Hume fingered his ray tube. And I am down to one full charge. Just one. Vi turned the knife he held around in his fingers, tried to imagine how one could face up to one of those tusked monsters with only this for a weapon. But if that thing had companions, none were coming in answer to its dying wails. And after it had been quiet for a while, Hugh motioned them out of hiding. From now on, we'll keep to the open. Better see trouble like that before it arrives. And I want to find a place to hole up for the night. They trailed along the steep upper slope, and in time found a place where a now-dried stream had once formed a falls. The empty watercourse provided an overhang, not quite a cave, but shelter. Gathering brush and stones, they made a barricade and settled behind it to eat sparingly of their rations. Water, a whole lake of it down there. The worst of it is that a water supply in a dry country is just where hunters congregate. That lake's entirely walled in by woodland, and provides cover for a thousand ambushes. We might find a way out before our water bulbs fail, I offered. Hume did not answer directly. A man can live for quite a while on very thin rations, and we have tablets from the Flitter emergency supplies. But he can't live long without water. We have two bulbs. With stretching, that is enough for two days, maybe three. We ought to get completely around the cliffs in another day. And if we do find a way out, which I doubt, we're still going to need water for the trek out. It's right down there waiting until our need is greater than either our fear or our cunning. 
Vi moved impatiently, his blanket-clad shoulders scraping the rock at their backs. You don't think we have a chance. We aren't dead, and as long as a man is breathing and on his feet, with all his wits in his skull, he always has a chance. I've blasted off-world with odds stacked high on the other side of the board. He flexed that plastiflesh hand, which was so nearly human, and yet not, by the fraction which had changed the course of his life. I've lived on the edge of the big blackout for a long time now. After a while, you can get used to anything. One thing I would like, to get at the one who set this trap, commented Vi. Hume laughed with dry humor. After me, boy, after me. But I think we might have to wait a long time for that meeting. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of Star Hunter